r slash ask reddit by reddit and chill. What is something you opted out of that went horribly wrong for those that went through with it? The Cave Creek disaster 14 people died when a viewing platform collapsed. It took 2 hours for the first responders to get there, which was no fault of theirs. It was simply rough terrain and isolated. Two of my mates died there, and I was meant to go, but was hung over as hell. I worked with the engineer who designed the platform about 3 years later, and the poor guy still believed it was his fault, which it wasn't. He designed it perfectly. The workers who constructed it used the wrong size bolts. Holy shit, I feel so damn bad for that guy. As an engineer, that's the scariest thing about what I do for a living. That I'll make the smallest of mistakes, and then find out years later that people died because of this one little thing I did wrong. It has literally kept me awake at night before, just going over things in my head, wondering if I didn't forget this or that. You sound like you're one of the good engineers. Keep it up. I live in Aurora, CO and I was planning on going to the showing of the Dark Knight. Not that I opted out, but my car battery died that night and I couldn't drive there. I thank my lucky stars that I was not involved and I'm terrified that I could have possibly died. Edit. Spelling. This is very eerie. Thankfully nobody I know was killed. Except a few of your puppies. I left my friend's 18th birthday party where everyone was already smashed. At approximately 7pm. Came back around 10 and pulled into the alley right in front of the police. Everyone went to jail but me and a very intoxicated friend who was passed out behind a shed and the police didn't see him. Editing to inform everyone who wondered why they were arrested that this took place in the US. Where the legal drinking age is 21. LOL your buddy was an exemption to those that went through with it. Exemption. Exception. Why would everyone be arrested? Shouldn't they just be cited? On a road trip. Everyone stopped at a Sonic and got burgers. I didn't get anything because I didn't want to be too gassy in the car. Everyone got terrible food poisoning. Except me. Good choice. You didn't get food poisoning. And they got Sonic. I'm really interested in what kind of responses you get to your username. Any good stories? Lots. I wouldn't share them without permission. Though and a lot of them are too personal to ask. I'd recommend r slash life in a post, if you're really interested. Not me, but back in the early 80s my dad was diagnosed with leukemia. I don't have all details correct, but the gist of it is, him along with several other people with the same affliction were given the choice to undergo the traditional method of treatment involving bone marrow transplants and whatnot, or go through with some kind of newer, experimental version of chemotherapy, out of the group of around 10 people. Him and a catholic priest chose chemo, while the others chose the bone marrow transplants. My father and the priest were the only ones to survive. Not everyone who has a bone marrow transplant survives, but for those that do, the recovery can be complete. My dad had one in 2012, and he's doing great. At the time he had his transplant, survival rates were a little better than 50% at the 2 years post transplant mark. It all depends on the type of leukemia and then the prognosis. I have had AML with a good prognosis. The prognosis levels are best, good, and bad. With a good prognosis, I had a 50% chance of traditional chemo giving me a survival of 5 years post treatment. One year post treatment, I relapsed and had to get a transplant. A 10 out of 10 HLA unrelated donor was found. Anyways, I was talking to my nurses and were hearing stories of how different things were just 10 years ago. I had my transplant in 2012, 10 years ago at MD Anderson. The floor was a completely isolated floor, isolated rooms, and generally a terrible place to be. It was a prison to help you live, and even then, the infection rate and complications were high. The way bone marrow was harvested and handled was completely different from today. I can only imagine what it was like in the 80s. Cutting edge medicine that is proven, but still learning how it all worked. Knowing that HLA tissue type is important in matching, but not knowing that 4 matched markers is not good enough till enough studies have been done. I am happy your father is around. I will say you are the first person to make me actually think about those before me. If it wasn't for those who came before me. Who were the brave to take the risk. I wouldn't be here. Thanks to the progress made by their lives. I am here.
My life is built upon the sorrows and pain that other families and patients have gone through. Every sample of blood that they have given. Every bone marrow biopsy, Every complication. Every reaction that has happened before me. Has helped me. Company I worked for. Large multinational. We located the division headquarters from where they had moved me 5 years before to a shithole city. They called it a lateral move. So there would be no pay increase. I took the severance package, and negotiated 6 additional months of work to train my replacements. During the 6 months I also got to attend a major user conference on the company expense. Bonus. With 2 months left in my tenure, they announced they were dissolving the division and selling off the resources. Most of my co-workers were left unemployed in a new city with no connections or prospects. I, on the other hand, stopped working on my designated day, a Friday, and started working my next job, for more money, the next Monday, with a nice fat severance check arriving 4 weeks later. Similar situation, our large network operation center in the Washington, DC area, after our director passed away suddenly and was replaced by someone who managed us from halfway across the country, had its work reassigned to two centers, one in Ohio and one in the Philippines. We were offered a small relocation package but no bump in pay, as the cost of living in this area of Ohio was quite a bit less than in the DC suburbs. Some of my colleagues decided to go to Ohio. I found a different position within the company at the same location. Within a year of my co-workers moving to Ohio, they were told the entire operation was moving to the Philippines, and there was no relocation opportunity for any of them there, I swear. Large, multinational corporations treat their employees like cattle. It's repulsive. But it's a living. I suppose. When I was a kid my family was supposed to take a bus trip to visit my aunt. My dad had a bad feeling the morning we were supposed to leave so we cancelled the trip. The bus was on a bridge that got hit by a ship and it went off into the water. I don't remember how many people died. But thank goodness my dad listened to his instinct. Wow that scene sounds like something straight out of a movie. Final destination. You'll all die. Eventually. Yeah. Not me. But my parents. They had planned a trip to Virginia Beach with a close friend of theirs. They were to take a small plane down. Spend a few days. Then fly back. My uncle DJ'd for a local radio station at the time and was given a few tickets to see the who. He offered his spares to my mom and dad, who accepted even though it was the same weekend as the planned beach trip. Their friend ended up going, but the flight back never made it. The pilot was advised not to depart, as there was severe weather along his flight path, but he went for it anyways. The plane crashed with no survivors. If it weren't for them deciding to go see the who, I wouldn't be here. I'm named after the friend that died, and was coincidentally born a year after the day they found out. Who told the pilot not to fly? Was it ATC? If so, why the yuck would they let him go anyways? A flight service station. They tell people about weather, traffic and a host of other things depending on the station, but they cannot issue commands or grant clearances. ATC cannot stop you from taking off because of bad weather along your route. A group of my friends were smoking synthetic marijuana at a party in the days where it was a new thing and hadn't made the news for the adverse effects it causes. I turned it down because I had college the next day and had to go home and rest up. I heard the next day that two of my buddies had ended up in hospital having suffered seizures and the third had suffered temporary heart problems. Law enforcement here. Synthetic cannabinoids get outlawed regularly but the problem is they're outlawed by chemical composition. Once one formula gets banned, they alter the composition just a little and legally it's a new substance and the ban process has to start anew. They're on something like the 6th generation of reformulation and they're putting some really god awful stuff in there. This is a bad scene. Too long didn't read you're not crazy. Kush K2 is getting worse. Whoa. If only there was something people could smoke that wouldn't kill them. Salmon? I was doing one of those really famous obstacle course mud races. Got to an obstacle that involved jumping off a 15 foot platform into muddy water. I climbed to the top. Took one look down. And freaked out. 
There was no way to tell how deep the water was because it was so muddy. And here were people smiling and doing flips off the platform into the water. I had tears running down my face from the panic. So I climbed down and ran around it. A few hours after my heat, a guy died on that obstacle due to accidental drowning. He went down and didn't come back up and just simply went unnoticed in the excitement and energy of the crowd. Which was my fear to begin with. Link. Journal News Net Link. Fixed a word. I work as a medic at that race. I know the exact obstacle you're talking about. I worked that event in November and they didn't even mention that this had happened to us. All the lifeguards were even talking about what they might do. And I don't remember a consensus being reached. My roommate and another very good friend competed in that race as well. They had similar feelings to yours, and were worried about their clothes and shoes weighing them down in the water. So also decided to skip the obstacle. I'm really thankful that they, and you, made that choice. Thankfully this wasn't me, but my friend was involved in it. A family was out making their first tandem skydive together at my home drop zone. The girl, I'll call her Lucky, had just turned 18 and she wanted to do a skydive but didn't want to go first once she arrived at the drop zone. In addition to Lucky, her grandmother, the 75 year old Claudette, wanted to skydive to check it off her bucket list. I skydived out of a small drop zone north of Las Vegas. It had one Cessna 182 and one tandem instructor at times. Because of this, only one person could go on a tandem jump that day. Lucky was too scared to go at first so Claudette opted to go in her granddaughter's place to show her that everything would be alright. Everything went fine on the free fall portion of the skydive. But when the parachute opened there was some sort of malfunction. The main canopy got tangled up somehow with the reserve and sent Claudette and her tandem skydiving instructor, my friend James Finesbeck, plummeting towards earth at a high rate of speed. James was unable to get the parachute opened and they impacted the ground. James, the hero that he was, put his back towards the ground to receive the full impact of the blow. He was trying to save Claudette. Sadly, she would pass away shortly thereafter. As sad as this is, I always think that fate, luck, or whatever you want to call it put Claudette in the plane that day to save the life of Lucky. So, was that the last thing on her grandmother's bucket list? Edit. Thank you for the gold. Fellow horrible human being. Holy shit. At my current age I'm not interested in skydiving but frankly, dying in a skydiving accident at 70 plus would probably be okay. Last year was my first year as a northeastern student. The Boston Marathon was going on about a mile away and my friend messaged me asking if I was still planning on going to see the finish line with them because it was Patriots Day and we had no class. Fortunately, I was a lazy arc and decided I'd rather take a nap than follow through on my plans with friends. Turns out my friends ended up not going when I decided not to meet up with them. I woke up to the sound of dozens of emergency vehicle sirens driving past. A couple of friends from college wanted to go camping one weekend. It sounded fun. So I asked my folks if I could borrow a tent and some supplies as we were big campers when I was young and my friend didn't have a tent. It gets closer to the time. And the situation changes to a hike before camping and doing it late in the evening after work to a campground that none of us had ever been to. I knew that the forest gets dark at least an hour earlier than open sky. Because of all the trees, I ended up deciding not to go as it just didn't sound like a good idea to me. Come to find out later, they went anyways. And my friend's dog who has a problem stomach got sick and had diarrhea in the tent that night. That would have been my tent. Totally expected some ghost story shit to go down in this one. But nope. A crapping dog. Even better. M. Night Shyamalan presents. The Tent. In Boy Scouts, I was supposed to be the acting senior patrol leader for the week long summer camp. I was going for my eagle at the time. And this trip was meant to prove my leadership skills. Beyond my project. I got pneumonia a couple weeks before the trip and had to pull out. On that trip. There were two very serious incidents that I would not have been able to prevent that would have been blamed on me. First, one of the scouts threw an aerosol can into the fire. No one there was brave enough to fish it out with a stick. So they all ran and hid. It turns out that the scoutmaster was driving into camp about that time. He pulled up to the campsite, stepped out of his jeep, and as he walked over to the fire, 
the can exploded. A few days after that, a couple scouts, both older than me, decided to use a spare tent to practice knife throwing. They completely ruined a big canvas tent. It's the only time that coughing so hard that it makes me vomit has ever felt like dodging a bullet. Holy crap. I remember we had to institute strict no aerosols rules because of stupid scouts. Edit. Just FTR I'm an eagle as well. And yes. Pretty sure every troop has problems with idiots. Whether it's a BSA troop overseas or middle of the US. There's some awesome scouts and scouters. And some real dolts. A kid in my troop drew a N on the scout master's tent with aerosol sunscreen. Bug spray maybe? I can't remember. And lit it on fire. With the scout master in the yucking tent. Needless to say the kid went to juvie for attempted murder by arson or something like that. LOL. Trustworthy loyal helpful right? Reading this thread makes me never want to leave my house again. Edit. Damn it you guys. I'm sleeping under the bed today. Opted out of cooking a communal curry while camping. Brought noodles for myself. Everyone called me noodle boy, but then someone accidentally dropped hexamine fuel tablets in the communal curry. Insta spoil. Luckily we were in a campsite near a town, rather than wilderness. They were able to pick up new supplies. What did they come back with? Noodles. Ha. Huh. This lady was once handing out a few letters at my high school graduation, and I happened to get one. It was a letter for a job opportunity at Vector Marketing and I thought that would be a pretty cool thing to try. It offered $18 HR for work that summer, and since I didn't have a job, I thought I'd sign up for an interview. But after doing some research online, I found out that the job is a complete scam. Basically, they hire you as a door-to-door -door salesman who sells massively overpriced knives, like $1000 for a set. They train you for 18 hours, unpaid. 6 hours a day, 3 days of training, to show you how to use the knives and how to sell them. Then, you go door to door and offer to show your product in an hour long sales presentation thing. You get your $18 HR if the person signs a form saying you've presented them the knives for an hour. You may think this system is really easy to beat. Just tell your friends to sign forms and then collect your $18 HR. However, if you don't sell any knives, then it reflects on your performance. They'll call you a bad salesman. They'll require you to do more training. There goes your possible resume resource. Too long didn't we'd almost worked for a company whose business plan was to prey on its own workers. Went to a college job fair where this lady had a stand for that. She was also really really hot. She also had big OS and she was wearing a really low cut shirt. So my paranoid mind starts thinking that the low cut shirt is part of the interview and I'm not supposed to look down. So I stare lasers into her eyes. Eventually I crack and literally turned around and ran away. I probably was going to take that job too. Too long didn't read. My social awkwardness saved me from knife job scam. Pyramid schemes are illegal where I live, but I got the vector calls. 2. I remember specifically that the calls said I was specifically selected based on my qualifications. Blah blah blah. I had literally just graduated from school, and never given my information out. I honestly think the school used some sort of an agency to send our information out to colleges, and that agency sold our information. Anyway, I got the calls and letters for a couple of years. When I was around 13 or 14 I used to walk a couple of dogs around my village on the afternoons. There was a cycle path to a neighboring village that I often took as it ended in a park. But on this one specific day, the dogs refused to go past the bridge halfway down. When I was younger my father warned me not to stand underneath this bridge as a car had crashed through the barrier in the past of all the weird stuff he could warn me about. But hey, and I therefore wanted to get out of the crash zone as it were. Instead of fighting with the dogs I turned round and went the other way. A man shot himself just around the corner from the bridge around the time we were there. I 100% believe dogs have an extra sense. Their senses of hearing and smell are hundreds of times better than ours. So who knows what they picked up on. The smell of gunpowder. The suicidal man's sweat. The sound of his heart pounding. Not me but my dad. He grew up in a rougher area of town. Basically his childhood reads like an S.E. Hinton book. Well him and his best friend are at a party and my dad decides to leave to hang out with this girl. Never sees his best friend again. 
All winter his friend is missing and Beth and Doomda run away until spring comes and they find his body in a stack of tires in a storage yard. Apparently my dad and his friend had pissed these two dudes off. Coincidentally, the two suspects die within a year of the body being discovered. One by a house fire and the other carbon monoxide poisoning. Karma is a BCH. Edit. I just want to make it clear that my dad did not go on a revenge fueled mission a la Liam Neeson these guys died in different parts of the country and I love my dad but, no he is not a criminal mastermind. I think he didn't find out about one of them dying until years after. I know the reddit happy ending is what you all were hoping for but the reality of it is that these tourists probably died at their own hands. Karma is a BCH, or your dad is a badass. With a particular set of skills. I don't know who you are but we'll find you and I will re-tire you. A few years ago, when I was just starting out at my first job out of high school, part-time minutes, wage, the works, my friend came to me with a great idea he had for a living situation, a nearby 5 bedroom house with lots of space that would be great for parties, and it would be super affordable since rent would be split 6 ways, I opted out because I didn't have a car and there were no buses in the area. My friend really wanted this house, so he kept asking around to any friends of friends that were looking to move. He thought he had gotten a pretty good group of people together, and he only didn't know two of the people. So it seemed okay at first. I went over there for parties every now and then, and every time I went there, I heard about something new going wrong. First, one of the guys living there was a quiet, solitary type. Who wanted out as soon as he realized that he basically moved into a frat house with people he didn't know. The other roommate that was kind of outside of our friend group had a string of emergencies that prevented her from paying rent. Which meant that everyone else they had to throw down even more to make ends meet. One of my friends, already starting to get into debt, moved back in with his parents and kept trying to get his money back from everyone else who was in the same situation and didn't have any money to give. After their second set of roommates ended up being total arrest or having medical issues that forced them to move out, the year long lease was finally up, and even after spending a week of solid cleaning and fixing things themselves, they still didn't get any of their security deposit back because parts of the house had gotten so jacked up. As I was helping my friends clean the house, they asked me, want to move in with us into a 4 bedroom house in the next town over? I said no politely, and, again. Watched things get worse for them all over at their new house. Ducking like and subscribe.